thank you. So uh, today we'll be presenting security in depth for Linux software, preventing and mitigating security bugs. So we have three main goals in this talk. Um, the first one is to explain how to implement security in depth and the least privileged principle in your Linux code. The second one is to explain um, how we design a few uh, sandboxes on Linux. And the third, the third goal is to convince you that good code writing practices and good design can work. Um, so first, um, quick definition, uh, what's security in depth? So security in depth comes from the principle that a secure application should have some tolerance for mistakes. Um, a single failure ideally shouldn't, shouldn't completely break uh, the security model of your application. So today we will try to address this from a Linux application programmer perspective and we'll be using um, um, Google, Chromium, and, and VSFTPD as examples in, during our talk. So there are many steps you can take uh, towards security in depth. Um, so the first one would be uh, having secure code and reducing the number of mistakes you make and not having vulnerabilities in the first place. Second step you can, you can have is um, application level exploitation mitigation. So you might have heard about uh, SSP from a propolis, um, which is uh, uh, stack canaries to, to prevent stack buffer overflows exploitation. You, you've probably heard also about system level exploit mitigation techniques such as uh, address space layout randomization, non-executability. Uh, you might have heard about privilege dropping, which we also call uh, sandboxing in this talk. And you might also know mandatory access control, and you've heard about security updates, right? So uh, in this talk, we will focus on, on only two, uh, two steps, which is secure code and privilege dropping. So the first, in the first part, um, I, will, I will talk about process and privileges in Linux in um, the classical sense, just as a quick reminder. So the privilege model of Unix, in a nutshell, it's, each process has its own address space. And um, the processor MMU enforces separation of different address space. And, and in this model, the kernel is a mandatory interface to the system from a um, um, process perspective. And the process is really the privilege boundary. Usually, you uh, associate a privilege with a process. Uh, also, some, something worth mentioning in the standard Unix security model is root has access to everything, and other users are subject to discretionary access control. Um, so, <coughs> privilege ordering can be, can be important, but usually it's, it's something hard to do. So, we'll define privilege ordering by saying if process A has, uh, process A has more privileges than process B, if A has access to every resource B has access to. So from this definition, we can say that any process running as root is more privileged than any other process because it can do everything on the system. That's in the general case. Um, two processes with the same UID and GID may have the same privilege. That's the usual normal case, but we'll see uh, some, some other cases. Um, and one can generally not compare two processes with different UIDs because usually they will just have access to a different set of resources, for instance, files, different files, different users on the same machines will have access to different files, for instance. Um, so threads, we've seen that pr the process was the privilege boundary. So usually there is no possible privilege separation inside a process. We'll see uh, uh, one exception today, which is the SecCom sandbox, which we, which we will introduce later. And there is also another one in Google, which is called Native Client. Also, debugging is quite interesting, because if A can debug, or you, the P-trace system call, on process B, then A is more privileged than B, because it can make B do whatever he, he wants. Um, so we have, in Linux, we have a few privilege-related facilities. So of course, the, the, um, the most known one is users and groups. So you have uh, many, many user ID. You have a, a general UID, then you have an effective uh, UID, you have a saved UID, you have a file system UID. The same for GIDs. 
And since Linux 2.2, you also have uh, POSIX capabilities, which have been designed as a way to split root privileges into uh, many different privileges. So uh, a definition that, that will be useful today is um, confused deputy. A computer program that is innocently <laughs> fooled to use its ambient authority is called a confused deputy. So for instance, um, we will see that a lot of the, um, the Linux privileges facilities have been thought as, as to reduce confused deputy problems. Um, so for instance, partial UID switching uh, is mostly useful to avoid this kind of problems. But it's completely useless in case of arbitrary co code execution when an attacker has complete control over your process because if your process can actually revert back and gain its privilege back, so can the attacker who is in control of your process. And uh, only root can use this facility of switching uh, UIDs. Um, Linux capabilities, so as I've said, um, Linux device root privileges into distinct units. So for instance, you have capnet raw, which allows you to use raw sockets. You have also capsys admin, and you have tons of them, like 20 of them. Um, capabilities have a few limitations. Uh, the first common mistake um, that, that you can see usually is forgetting to switch from UID 0. Even if you drop all capabilities or most capabilities, you have to switch from UID 0. Second mistake is a lot of capabilities are root equivalent. So for instance, there is a capability that allows you to load module into the kernel. So obviously that's root equivalent. So in this case, we say capabilities are only useful for confused deputy problems in this particular case. But you can also make good use of capabilities if you know what you're doing. Um, also, capabilities are a root privilege dropping facility. You need to be, um, I mean, um, a normal user has no capability. So he has nothing to drop there. So you can uh, read in the appendix more about capabilities. We're not going to talk too, too long about that. So changing roots, it's, it's probably one of the most used tricks to drop privileges. So it's a very popular way to drop file system access. Um, how else would you drop access to files that are readable by anyone? Uh, the problem with changing roots is it requires dropping privileges afterwards because otherwise it's extremely easy to escape from a CH root sandbox because you root, you can do whatever you want. You can load <laughs> modules, uh, you, can, uh, you can change the network, you can p-trace any process on the machine, so you can easily escape from that. So you need to drop privileges afterwards. Uh, something that is, is not very, very well known yet is the new namespaces. They came, they came since Linux 2, 6, 19 and uh, with uh, very recent additions, uh, even in uh, 2.6.26. Um, so it's, it's a courtesy of the Linux containers, which allows you to create many virtual containers on the same machine. And so uh, we'll see how to use them. But uh, uh, in recent kernels, you have um, clone new PID, for instance, which allows you to get a new PID namespace for your process. Also, another interesting one is clone new net, which allows you to get a new network namespace. And we'll see how we can use that to drop privileges. However, those are also only accessible by root. You have something that's, um, that has always been there in Linux. It's resource limits. Uh, they can be used for security. So for instance, you have R limit no files, which, which restricts you from getting new file descriptors. Uh, it's, it's a good way to somehow drop, um, drop access to the file system, but, but even without getting new file descriptors, you cannot open new files, but you can still rename uh, existing files, or you can still unlink, which means delete existing files. So it's kind of limited, but it can be useful. Uh, also, if you use that for security, you need to put the limit to zero, because if you put a higher limit, then an attacker could just close the file descriptor to open a new one. Um, something worth mentioning too is uh, the dumpable flag in, in, in the process. So uh, Linux supports a pair process dumpable flag. And what that allows you to do is to say, OK, I don't want to be debugged. No one should be able to debug me. And so if you, if you have that, if you do that, it's, it's not really privilege dropping. It's more a privilege elevation because before every um, other processes could, could debug you, no, they can. So it's a privilege elevation. But it's still useful in this talk, because if you elevate your privilege, you're consequently lowering uh, the other's process privilege. So it's kind of a privilege.